In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Holy God, mighty God, immortal God, teach us his things that are eternal. As the book of Ecclesiastes says in chapter 5, you put eternity in each of our hearts. When we hear the word of God, may we desire to know the fullness of its meaning, now and always. Bless this word to our hearts, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So let's go to one of the 39 parables that Jesus teaches us. Did you probably tell more parables? Yes. Do we know them all? No. Will you know them all? Perhaps one day in glory, when you go through the thousand year reign. Amen? Amen. Everybody with me in verse 25. Behold. Bum, 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 ba, ba, bum. Oh, oh, that was loud. A lawyer stood up to put him to the test. Now, underline that. A lawyer. Lord save us from lawyers. <laughs> they charge too much. My brother warned me. He says, I gotta take you to a lawyer because we gotta put your will down. So I can make sure I get your money when you go. I'm like, all right now. <laughs> Uh, and then he gave me in case you want to put any other charities in there, like the Beatles or Middletown or something like that. So, the barn. Yep, th those would be all great things. Um, next, a lawyer, now underline the word test. In Greek, the word test means to set a trap. Let me give you the picture. How many ever tried to catch a mouse? <laughs> I did. With a trap. Mm -hmm. yeah. With a little, little piece of cheese. Mm -hmm. Or the peanut butter. <laughs> <laughs> so you all have rat taste. Did you know that? Peanut butter and the cheese. So now, what they tried to do to Jesus is trap him. So it's, this is called the, 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 the rat attack. Amen. But if we want to be milder, the mice attack. Amen. One day I was at St. Antoninus. I was walking down the stairs and I saw George. And his tail was. And then we put all these traps all over the parking lot. And guess what I discovered? There was George, Georgette, and Georgine all out there. I saw three of them. Come on. And guess how big they were? Big mamas. Big mamas. Okay. Amen? So they try and trap you. Next he says there, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, he asks the basic question. He says to Jesus, Didaskos, Jesus is per excellent, the, the, the most incredible teacher you ever want to teach you, yes? yes? Now, when you understand Jesus' teachings, he, he always makes us go deeper. Teacher, what must I do shall I inherit eternal life? That is the most important question you can ever ask. How do I get there? Circle so the word eternal. Jesus, how, what do I do to, to have quality forever after? Amen? How do I want a quality forever after? What must I do to inherit? Um, what is written in the law? Now, uh, uh, in fact, God says go back to the law. What's the law? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. What's the law? 613 laws. Okay? So, when you read the law, how, how do you read it? How do you read it? And this is what he says there. He says, And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. All right, now that's called by us the greatest commandment. Now what Jesus does there masterfully is he takes, um, he takes two scriptures. He takes what the Jews have to say every single day. What do you say every day in prayer? What do you pray every day in prayer? Anybody ever say Hail Mary every day? Mm -hmm. Anybody say Our Father every day? Yes. Anybody say the Apostles Creed every day? Yes. Okay. So he takes Deuteronomy 6 and then he mixes it with Leviticus 19.8. He takes Deuteronomy and then he mixes it to form what is called the greatest law. Okay? So, 
How do you read the law? Are we into the law right now? Yes. He takes what is called the second law. Deuteronomy means law two. Because they failed that law number one. Then he takes Leviticus where all the sacrifices are being what? Offered. Now stay in the context and you're going to see the beauty of what Jesus is saying. So he says here, this is called in Hebrew, as you know, the Shema. Now if you're Jewish, anybody have any Jewish friends? Yeah, I've got a few more Jewish. Okay, welcome aboard. What you would have to do if you practice your Jewish faith, you have to wake up before the sun rises and say the Shema. The Shema is Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 9. Hear, O Lord, the Lord our God is one. As soon as you say the Lord our God is one, you're Jewish. As soon as you say the rest of this, you're really Jewish. Now, what do we say? What do we say to be Christian? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. What do you say if you're Mohammed? Mohammed is the prophet and Allah is God. Allah is what? As soon as you say that, you are Mohammedan, you are Islam. I'm not going to say that. Uh, amen? amen? Okay, now I can say Deuteronomy because my Lord uses it. Then, so he, then he takes Leviticus 19.8. This is called the Holiness Code. You really want to be holy? See that person next to you? The person next to you, you got to love the person next to you as much as you love yourself. Now, when you put these two together, you get what is called the greatest commandment. Let's break it down. Let's break down the greatest commandment. You ready to go? Yeah. Alright, Deuteronomy. You shall love. Alright, now there's a commandment. John 13, 35 says, They're going to know your disciples by your what? Love. Your God with your, your whole heart. Now, your heart is, in Greek, there to be cardia. K-A-R-D-I-A. It is not your little heart inside. You've got to love God with all of your emotions. Do you? You can't try. Those who try will never be redeemed. Well, your how, many have ever seen, how many have ever seen a picture of the Sacred Heart? Mm -hmm. Why is his heart exposed? You see in the back there, there's the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Why is it exposed? You know what that means? Does everybody know what it means? No. I'm loving you with all my emotions. Two little kids are fighting. The mother says, stop doing it, say you're sorry. Sorry. Did he show a lot of emotion? No. I'm really sorry. That would have been nice. And put some onions on your shirt and get some tears going. So when you love, it's got to be with all of your emotions. How many here, do you love her with all your emotions? No? You do, sort of. When she's not with you for one day, do you get emotional over it? When she goes to Florida for a few days and she's at the airport, do you run to grab her and hug her? <laughs> so, how many here can love God with your cardia? Does everybody here love God emotionally? I think it's so clearly now that we're finally getting to get now with all your soul. How do you say soul? Suke. P S U C H E. How many here love God with all of your thoughts? Let me tell you a little spiritual secret. The more you have a passion for Christ, the more you can't think about anything else. When people say, 
Doesn't that thought bother you? No. Look at these beautiful girls walking in front of you. Don't you want to follow them like a periscope? I said, no. I, I scream at them, they put their clothes on. Doesn't that bother you? I said, no. Because I'm passionately in love with Jesus. I'd rather see Jesus than three naked women walking around with their with flip flops going on during church. Mm -hmm. Amen. <coughs> so, how many here love God with your whole soul, all your thinking? In Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, what do you got to do? Get renewed by your thinking. How many want to grow spiritually? Can I tell you in one word how to get your whole life together spiritually? You got crazy thoughts. Amen? And how many know when you get older, you get kookier? <laughs> <laughs> and if you are more than 50 years married, do you hear what each other says to God all does? <laughs> Amen? Now, did she ever repeat to you? She does. Does he ever repeat to you? Yes. Yes. All right. And guess what? More repetition is coming, so get used to it. <laughs> now, with all your strength, so how many here love God with your, all your emotions? How many here love God with all your thoughts? How many love God now? Strength. Now, when I was studying Hebrew, this really blew my mind. I always thought strength is like a muscle. It doesn't mean anything of the sort. It means your money. It means all of your wealth. How many just learned something new? It means your wealth. That's why I gotta make sure that I really wanna be generous in giving my tithe all the time. Amen? I wanna, I wanna give into the kingdom. I want, Irma, I want seat number four in heaven. <laughs> yes, Amen? So I want to be a generous person. And then next he says there, and with all your mind, what does mind mean? Your mind. Now, what's the main target for everybody here? Where the arrows go at Ephesians 6? The arrows hit your stinking thinking. Amen? Amen? Next he says there, and then he says, and, now here comes Leviticus 19. So there's Deuteronomy the Shema. Because why does Jesus take this? Because they say it, how many times do they say it every day? Five times a day. Anybody have Muslim friends? They throw their rug down. And sometimes you see them on the street, like Washington DC. They get down on, on, and they put their face on the ground. And why do they do it five times a day? They copy the Jews. Will they tell you that? No. Do they copy the Jews? Yes. Now, how do we copy the Jews? We have a prayer book called the Breviary. And how many times do we pray a day? Do you understand five times a day? Mm -hmm. Because we've got to say, that's our Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. That's what I say five times a day. Amen? Yeah. Before I came here and I had my holy hour, I was doing the Shema, the Catholic Shema. Israel. A lot of uh, St. Thomas intercede for us today. Hmm. Then he says there, love your neighbor as yourself. Now, building on this, when you go to Leviticus 19, verse 8, when you build on this, you build on the idea, the word neighbor there, if you underline the word neighbor, the word neighbor means, you're not going to like this, the person next to you. All right, take a quick glance at the person next to you. <laughs> Is that a scary sight or what? Did you look at the person next to you now? You've got to love that person as much as you look you. And you get to see one person all the time. Fifty-four years. Yeah. Amen? Day after day. Amen? How are you getting it? Yes. Now, are we supposed to love some people more than others? No. Do we? Yes. Of course. Is that God's in that? When we go to glory, we're going to love all of everybody the same. Amen? Because in heaven, I told you, there are no celebrities. Yes. Isn't that good? There's no celebrities? 
we're not going to get anybody's autograph in heaven. You want Jesus. Amen? Now watch this. This is really good. So who do I got to love? Everybody that's next to me. How much do I got to love them? By the way, if you don't love yourself, please don't love me. So, what does Paul say in Ephesians chapter 5 when you're married? You take care of your wife before you do yourself. Do you do that all the time? <laughs> when you come to the door, Lillian, my love. And then, if you have to, you pick her up and you carry her across the threshold. <laughs> Even if you're 55 years married, you do it again. So, what does neighbor mean? The person next to you. Okay, everybody got all that in mind? All right, we broke down what is called the greatest command. Also, it appears in Mark chapter 12. So, so, so let's really break this down now. The man's trying to, he, he quotes Jesus, he puts Deuteronomy 6.49 and Leviticus 19.8 together. How many know the man looks like this right about now? Hmm. Hmm. Now, can I make a suggestion to you? When Jesus says something to you, stop right there and don't ask him any more questions. Because when you and I ask no more questions, it gets more difficult to do what he says. Okay, amen? But guess what? The man didn't stop. So he says, verse 29, and desiring to justify himself. Oh, that's an easy one. You know what? I, I, I know the Bible. You know what? I do the Shema every day, five times. You know what? I love people. And then he says, yeah, I'm doing a pretty good job. How many know you can't justify yourself? That means make yourself look good with you. How many realized in your life when there was a problem, you were never at fault with anything? It was always the other person. How many ever realized about you yet? When you're married, it was always her fault. Oh, of course. Amen? It was never your fault. Amen? How many, how many have ever said, Donald, it's my fault. <laughs> you don't do that, right? <laughs> when Sister caught us talking, I said, Sister, it wasn't William. It was Joseph. <laughs> it, it, and he started. <laughs> because innate within all of us, we can't take the blame for anything. Did you notice that? Mm -hmm. That's called justifying yourself. So he says to us, verse 29, and said to Jesus, and who's my neighbor? You shouldn't have that. <laughs> who's the person next to me? It's very easy to take care of the person next to you. They look good, they're handsome, they're, they're, they're gorgeous and everything else. They're well dressed and everything else. But when they're bad off, oh baby. Now watch, this is a good, good soup. Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now, Let's go very, this is how many are you getting good stuff? Jericho and Yerushalayim. Uh, and some of you were with me when we were eating bread in Jerusalem. Do you remember that? Eating bread? It's about 18 miles. Notice it says they were going down from Jerusalem. Here's Jericho. Here's Jerusalem. Everybody see that? Jericho. Jerusalem, Jericho, Jerusalem. And it says, going down from Jerusalem. What's wrong with that picture? It's going up. What is it? Well, did they get it mixed up? No, because the highest mountain to live in is Jerusalem. That's why we're going to see wonderful things as I pick Peggy up on bus 226. <laughs> But we're going to tour a lot of places. We're going to go a lot of new places. But as soon as you peg into Jerusalem, you're going to feel like you've been there before. And everything is going up to Jerusalem. And then when we leave Jerusalem, everything is going down. Now, Peggy, when we go into Jerusalem, we're going to turn on this mi mi music on the bus. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, yon tan ta tan tan. This is where you stand on bus 275. Dun, 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 dun. And Irma, we were saying, 
Amen. So now, did you notice? Did you notice that right there? Going what? Down. But they're going 18 miles. You got, you got it? You got the picture? Because the highest. Now watch this. They're going down. Let me give you. Scooby Dooby, Dooby Dooby, Dooby Scooby. Yellow shine. Now, what they would encounter is a lot of hills. And we have Yeriko. Yeriko is the city of palms. It means palm fragrance. So how many would like to leave Jerusalem to go to palm fragrance? Is that some of your new stuff you squirt on today? Oh, I'm just putting on palm fragrance. <laughs> Amen? Do you like palm fragrance? They made fragrance. So when you went into Yerushalayim, when you went into Yeriko, you would see the whole thing. Next, he says there, she's replied, a man was going down from uh, Yerushalayim to Yeriko and fell among the robbers. So, he's going from Jerusalem to Jericho. And he falls among robbers. Why? Because he takes a common path. And the common path was a lot of twists and turns, especially when you hit the mountains. How many ever went around a bend and you get a surprise? I was about this close from hitting a deer tonight. Wow. I was coming around the bend and a deer decided that he was going to walk across the street at that time. And as soon as my car came right there, he decided to put on his brakes and turn around. I said, good for you, deer. <laughs> because I could have had Smushville. Amen? And so now my prayer still is, Lord, keep your pets off this road. <laughs> <laughs> so what was he doing in Jerusalem? He's praying. Praying. He was offering sacrifice to God. Are you getting this? So he's coming around the back, coming around the mountain, and she comes to the Do you like the musical? That church, as it comes around the mountain right here, he gets attacked. He gets jumped upon. He gets beaten. Ooh. Ooh. This is really, really not good. Now, what's the surrounding mountain over here? It's a town hall where I'm taking you. When I pick Peggy up on bus 317. What's the name of the mountain? Samaria. What's next to Jericho? Didn't they take you to Samaria? So, what's right over here? Samaria. If you're Japanese, you say Samurai. <laughs> samurai. And these little black dudes come out with a little, little uh, chop chop. They wear black hoods and go, hey, chop. You got that? Okay. This is trying to make the Bible come alive, brother. Boy. Okay. Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jericho and fell among the robbers who stripped him and beat him and, and departed, leaving him half dead. Well, why did they strip him? Because he could. What kind of clothes was he wearing? Temple clothes. Did they look nice? Now years ago, this is like a thousand years ago, when the dinosaurs walked the earth, you would never go to church the way people are dressed today. It's a disgrace the way people are dressed today. You would go in with dresses, and, and, and you'd go in with slacks, you'd go in with... You look the part. Amen? So he's coming from Jerusalem. He turns the corner and they jump to him. They like his clothes. They take his cell phone. 
It was, the, it was difficult getting Wi-Fi on the mountain up there. <laughs> <laughs> they, they beat him, they take off his temple clothes. Now watch this, this is really, do you think Jesus is trying to make a point here? He says to them, now by chance, a priest was going down that road. All right, what was the priest doing? Now who's the priest? Oh, he's somebody special, where's he coming from? The temple. The temple, okay. So did you notice everything's focused in on the? Temple. Temple. These are all church people. How many have ever been upset with a church person before? Nobody. How many ever got mad at a clergyman before? Nobody. This is a great group. How many have ever said, I can't believe she's a Catholic? Amen? How many have ever said those statements before? Now he comes and he says, and he was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Now, what's he doing? I see him on the road and I see him and maybe he's heading toward Jerusalem on the other, he goes on the other side. Why? Why does this priest, who you want somebody to lead you, why, did, why does he go on the other side? Because, now is he wrong in thinking this? I gotta go pray to God. And I got all these rules and regulations, and when I get all these rules and regulations, I'm not supposed to touch anybody that looks bad. Because if I touch somebody that looks bad, I can't go into the temple and worship God. And you know what? I don't want anybody's cooties. Do you remember that French word, cootie? <laughs> so how many here think that priest was right? Now, in the law, he just went, Now I can continue to do what? I continue to pray. There was an undertaker that was trying to win him to the Lord. What a lulu. And he said, Father Bill, get in the car. I'll take you to the bone yard. So every week I had to do, I had to go to the bone yard. And he says, I didn't go to Mass again today. I said, I think you want to tell me why. Yes. Because I was taking somebody, getting them ready for the boneyard, it says. Now, in one sense, he was legitimate. If somebody's really, really sick, would you do a favor to stay home and take care of them? Amen? But now, we have somebody here who's a Kohen. Was he wrong or right? The law said he was what? Right. What does the Holy Spirit say? You're wrong. Hmm. Do you, think the, do you think the lawyer is getting something here? Next, he says there. So likewise, a Levite. Now, look at verse 32. Now, a Levite was birthed in Exodus 32. What happened was they had to kill the first 3,000 people. Because they didn't want to come to the other side. They were white. They did this altar serving. They, they blew the trumpet. They formed a 4,000 member choir. So they were servants. They cleaned things and everything else. So a Levite's coming. And when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. Why? Because what was he saying? I got to do what? I got to serve the Lord. Tell me, what should I do? Mass is ready to start in about 30 seconds. Somebody comes up to me and says, I gotta go to confession. What should I do? That's happened a lot, what should I do? Be my spiritual director, what should I do? What if he goes on for 10 minutes? And the people are saying, <laughs> what should I do? Keep it short, baby. We'll love you. <laughs> so now we have two people in religion. The priest, the Kohen, the Levite, who's, who's one goes to pray and one goes to what? Serve. And guess what? They don't touch the person. Who had that same problem? 
St. Francis of Assisi. At first he couldn't, he couldn't embrace the leper. Embrace lepers. Get the cooties. How many ever heard of Father Damien in the island of Malachi? Yes. What he did is, uh, leprosy is not contagious. But what he did was, he so took up their forks and he so took up their spoons, he got leprosy. He died of leprosy. At the ripe old age of 46. Did he have to die that way? No. But he so embraced the people, the lepers of his day, he ate from their utensils. Which is not a wise thing to do. Amen? So, uh, so Father Damien, and when I was in Honolulu a couple years ago, I saw a leper there and his hand was eaten away. And the Holy Spirit said, Bill, yes! Embrace him. So this man was, had his hand eaten by leprosy. I said, hey brother, how's it going? Keep your leprosy away and I'll give you another. <laughs> <laughs> so I embraced the leper. I was blessed to embrace the leper. Amen. So you got two people now, number three. But a Samaritan as he journeyed came to where he was. Now where's the Samaritan? We told you it's the next hill. You got the picture? You got the geography? Now when you read St. Luke, Geography plays a very important part. This is biblical geography. So the Samaritan comes in now. The Samaritans get their start in the year 721 BC. The north came down. There was an enemy called Sennacherib. And some of you pronounced the other day Sennacherib. <laughs> yeah. So Sennacherib came down and he destroyed the north. And when he destroyed the north, he took over and forced the Samaritans to intermarry. And they only believe, ready, hello, they only believe in the first five books of the Bible. Now, when I take you, ma'am, and when we pick up um, Peggy on bus 517, when I take you to Samaria, you're going to see that spot. They may not love and run up to you in Samaria. So what happens here is they only believed in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Why don't they believe in the rest of the books of the Bible? Because when you read the prophets, they attack Samaria. So what they said, let's get rid of those books of the Bible. So when we go to Samaria, and by the way, when I'm when I'm in Samaria explaining this, I can't explain that to you if they're listening. Mm -hmm. So when we get back on the bus, way out of earshot, I'll tell you all about that again. Mm -hmm. So here now, why do you think now they're focused on Deuteronomy and Leviticus? Because they believe in it. There was another group like them called the Sadducees. And Jesus has to respond with these books. Are you getting it? So now he comes in from Samaria. And does he really want to go to Jerusalem? No. Because these people in Jerusalem don't like us. Hmm. Because they call us illegitimates. They call us half priests. So was he journeying or, or thinking of Jerusalem? No, because when Jesus comes to Samaria, and who was there later on? Philip, remember Philip? Mm -hmm. and, and he was there. Remember Philip? Philip was there. And so. He comes and he says, this, we hate these people. Literally, we hate them. He's a lawyer now, you get in the picture? I hate those people. How many know you, we all grew up with prejudices here? Amen? And because of the prejudice that my neighborhood was in, we, we learned to hate certain people. Thanks be to God for Jesus Christ, amen? amen. That we've got to love our neighbor, amen? amen. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, verse 33, came to where he was, and he saw him, he had compassion. Now, compassion means, if you look at the two words of compassion, you suffer with people. As somebody suffers, you've got to take on their suffering. That means you want them to be relieved. 
That means you don't want them to suffer. So now he says there, there verse number 34, and went to him and bound him up his wounds. Okay, so what did he do, the Samaritan? He touched somebody. He went, and, and, and how many know we've we got to get to the point where we've got to start touching people, amen? So he bound up his wounds. He cleaned them like a Mother Teresa. So what did he do? He broke all Jewish protocol. You don't touch people with pus coming out and everything else and wounds. So he goes out of his way to show compassion. You've got to touch people and go to their wounds. Then he says there, the next thing he says there, good stuff, pouring on oil. Now, pouring on oil was an expense. So what does he do? You could tell he's, he's walking along and so he takes out oil. And so he takes an expense and he pours on something precious to himself. Oil was a commodity. In the book of Hosea chapter 2 and chapter 4 of Hosea, when you poured out oil it shows that you had money. So he takes out his money and he starts already pouring over the oil all over him. Next, what's the next thing he does? And wine. So you can circle the word there, oil and wine. These are two top commodities that a person would have. Boy, he's pretty well traveled, isn't he? He's taken some of his wealth with him on this journey around the bend. So oil and wine. Now, what does that mean? If you go all the way back again to the book of Hosea. Remember Hosea had to marry a lady called Gomer. What a lady. Lady's name, Gomer. And I don't even think of Gomer Pyle. So Gomer. <laughs> So he marries Gomer, and what did Gomer want to prostitute herself? Bring in all the oil and the wine you want. You got the oil, honey, I got the time. You got the, oil, you got the wine, honey, I got the time. So in comes the, from Hosea. Can I ask a question? And what did, I'll be right with you. So we can see a little bit of Hosea here. Accept the people in their brokenness and pour out what you got for them. Nah, not those people. Yes? Do you think that he saw the others um, ignore the guy? Is that, and that so, that gave him the compassion to help? Because that the others he, ignored him? Yeah. That the I don't think he saw them. Okay. Because guess what? These guys hated these guys. Amen? But that's what I'm trying to say, because he knew that... If he saw them, he would have hated them. He would have hated them. But, guess what we just learned? He's one of them. Because where did the man come from? So guess what he is? He's one of them. Whoa, somebody said, whoa. See the two hated fashions? You could read John 4, Jesus and the Samaritan. By the way, her name is Botina. When we go to Samaria, you can, you can see where Fotina was. And so there we can see he was coming and he's all beaten up. I just heard something beautiful on the news. You don't hear a lot of beautiful things. Mm. Just happened about a week ago. The Jews just let in Muslim Syrian children in and they, they're taking care of them. Is that beautiful? Yes. They're coming in from the war area of Syria and they crossed in the border of Israel, and the Jews are taken care of. Now, how many know that's beautiful? Amen? I had a Muslim woman, and she was a, she was a, she was a Baptist. She said, Reverend, I said, yes. <laughs> she says, I'm hungry. I said, I'm gonna give you something to eat. Reverend, I need some money for my house, because we just got burned down. I'm gonna give you something for the house. She wasn't my religion. I don't even like a religion. But she was a person. And so I had to show compassion. Now, would that happen if I knock on their door? I don't think as, as well I'd be received. Amen? So do you see what's happening here? Now, watch this. All right, everybody got the oil and the wine down? Yes. Why, why did the, I couldn't hear you. Why did the Samaritan stop because he was different from the priest and the... Uh, he, was, he was different he, because he had compassion. He says, look at this guy! And he says, he says right there, i got to do something. Now, the problem was he was from over here. They couldn't stand each other. Amen? Are you getting this? 
So he's walking on this path and there's this guy all beaten up. How many think you could do that? One day I was going to Bible study. And I saw, literally, I saw an old lady in the, on the street. And I'm like, there's a body in front of my car. I went, <laughs> so what did I do, run over her? No. No, we, we picked her up. We put her on the side. We wait till the ambulance came. We called 911. Well, we're going to be late for Bible study. It didn't matter. We had to wait till Grandma was okay. What happened is she uh, she had dementia and everything else, and she just walked out. So she passed out in the middle of the road. Amen. Five Hail Mary, sister. Now watch this. Then he set him on his own beast. All right, now, what kind of beast did he have? Donkey Express. So now, <laughs> if he's on the donkey, if he puts the person on the donkey, what's he doing? Walk out. So not only does he give oil and wine, Hosea chapter 40, uh, chapter 4, chapter 2, but he now says, a walk. Now, what's he walking? He's walking all the way down this path. It's very dangerous because more, more of those thugs could be there. Next, he says there, and brought him to an inn and took care of him. Now, an inn was a little uh, baby uh, motelette. It goes up to the counter, rings the bell, ding! I need a room for this guy. But I'm going to take care of him. But he remembers he has to go back to the matter for a little bit. He says, uh, I'll give you my credit card. <laughs> Here's my credit card. Charge whatever you want on it for him. Anybody that kind of neighbor? Anybody that kind of neighbor? Then he says there, on the next day, verse 35, he took out two denarii. By the way, a denarii is one wage per day. So he took out two days of pay. And gave him to the innkeeper. Take care of him and whatever more you spend, I will pay you when I come back. Then Jesus says, which of these three do you think proved neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, the one who showed mercy. How do you say mercy? Elios. To the one who really showed mercy. Now, did he say, did he name the Samaritan? Why did he say the word Samaritan? I can't stand them. So what did he say? The one who showed mercy. So did he still need conversion? Why didn't he say the Samaritan? Well, Jesus is focusing here. That's where the cross would be. But he said, how about these people over here? He couldn't say the word Samaritan. Stuck here. Now, here's the question. The one who showed mercy to him. Jesus took that as an answer. Okay, now you go. Now, <coughs> the word go. It means this. Now, here's the, here's the scary thing about go. It's in the progressive sense. As you are going. You don't know what you're going to encounter tonight. I hope you, hopefully you all go home and you go to your bed and you sleep very well. But guess what? As you're going, you might encounter something. Three weeks ago today, my mother died. So I encountered something and I shifted here. Was that part of my plans? No. I was going to Miami the next day or so. Thanks, Mom. I got Miami canceled. Was that part of my plans? No. You gotta, as you go, you gotta show Elios. It sounds like an Italian pizza. You gotta give people, who's your neighbor? Give everybody, look at the person next to you again. <laughs> give everybody next to you even what you think they don't deserve. This past week we went to watch the Yankees win in Philadelphia. They decided to take us for a Philly cheesesteak, incredible in South Philly. Unbelievable. 
Let's go there, just to drive and get one of those things. <laughs> there was a demented lady. She looked like she had a broomstick ready to fly off. Her hair was all straggling. She was talking to herself. What, what did our group do? We fed her, gave her money, and hugged her. Amen? Yeah. We showed compassion. Yes, sir. So the help father has to be not just in feeling sorry, but reflected in compassion, which is deeds. Yes. Now what we do, to our credit, not to our credit, to our credit, not to our credit. Uh, there's just a terrible earthquake right now. We're going to take up another collection. Please be generous. All right, you reach in. All right there, I feel good. I just threw in some money. That's good. Did you obey God? Yeah. But it's got to go way beyond that. Did you ever hear a missionary talk in your church? Do you know they say the same thing all the time to us, every missionary? I ask you two things, to pray for us and cough it up. That's not, that's not a good way to present it. Amen? So, how many here have compassion? What should we say? When you hear the gospel, you say, what should I do? So, circle word go. When you circle the word go there, put in the word the progressive sin as you go. As you are going. Amen? Now, here's a little tiny vignette story of Martha and Mary. This is the story right by the graveyard of the family plot. Who's going to be buried there? Then, then I'm going to go into now, we're going to teach you uh, probably more toward next week, to really get into prayer, the most important missing ingredient while your prayer is going to hurt. You ready for that? Okay, the most important missing ingredient. And now as they went on their way, he entered a village, and a woman named Martha received it into his house. Now this is called, anybody remember the town? Bethany. Anybody with me? Do you want to go to Bethany, ma'am? Yes. It's a dangerous area. Do you defend me? Okay, let me tell you something. Irma was, looks like camels in that, in that town. We were on the bus and they were all looking at us. We went into that church. Do you remember the church we went into? You got your throat ch uh, blessed? <laughs> that was their house. Do you know that was their house? Did you go there? You know, take another tour, sister. That was their house. Remember where we were in there? Now, from there, that's where Jesus went. Now, he says there, and she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet. All right, underline that. What are you called to do is sit at God's feet. What does that mean? You're a disciple. What a disciple said, I've got to take this in. Amen? Now, I always say to you, you're a disciple if you sit there and take in the word of God. And I always invite notebooks and pens and pens. Why? Because you want to tell somebody else this. Yes. This is the good news of salvation. Amen? So what is she doing? She's sitting there. I hope you appreciate what I got to do to get my point across. And she, she comes from a long, big, flowing dress. And she plops right in front of Jesus. Why? Because the feet mean I'm willing to learn so my feet will walk in your direction. So what does she do? She sits at his feet. Amen? Okay? How many are sitting at Jesus' feet? Next he says there, She has this called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha, she was the broom lady. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Martha was distracted and much serving. Was that good? Absolutely. Is it good to get teaching? Yes, it's absolutely to serve. By the way, how do you say serve? Diaconia. Anybody remember that word in Greek? You ever heard it before? Deacon, very good. She was doing diaconia. And the other one was going. Okay, so she was sitting there. Now, if you're doing diaconia, how many would be peeved? Would you be mad? I'm doing this, and you're just sitting there. And 
guess what she did? She broke every bristle on her broom. <laughs> and so she's going, and all the bristles are going, doing, 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 they're shooting all over the floor. Amen? <clears throat> and remember, they didn't have floors like that, a lot of dirt around and everything else, so she's trying to clean up and get the dust cloud out and everything else. But guess what happened? In her anger, she's forming a bigger dust cloud. Now, ready? So, what do we need? We need teaching? Yes. And what do we need? The yakunia. Now, teaching leads to service. What did, what, did, what did she say? Service leads to keeping busy. Then he says there, Martha was distracted with much and Lord! How do you say Lord in Greek? Gordios! K-U-R-I-O-S. Gordios! Don't you care? Don't you care that my sisters love me? <laughs> you should see Eileen I, I mean and Jackie when they were growing up. Well, those two were going at it. Don't you care? Mommy! Don't you care that my sisters left me to serve alone? Tell her to help me! <laughs> How many know they want Jesus to get in the middle of this one? <laughs> Two women? <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you something, ladies. No extra charge for these lines. This is called Two Queen Bees. Yes. <laughs> Amen. Okay. This is really scary. This is really scary. And Jesus said, Martha! Martha! Now, this is called, in the Bible, the double vocative. Here's what Jesus said in Hebrew. I What's the double vocative? When you get your name called twice, you've heard it before. Moses. Moses. Lee. Lee. Dono. Dono. Amen. How many ever gave somebody the double vocative here? <coughs> it means, I'm dead serious. You get your name twice, baby. Mar. Mm, Caroline. Ca sweet Caroline. Caroline. Did your mother ever call you twice? Yeah. She did. So, what, did you, so your mother used the double vocative on you? She did? Does she still use the double vocative on you? No, just once is enough. Huh? So here comes the double vocative. Are you getting it? Caroline, I'm Martha. Martha. Now here's something really good. And you're going to be pleased that Jesus says it to him. He says, but you are anxious and troubled about many things. It wasn't that she was sweeping the broom. What was she anxious about? I want to be there. I should be there. But who's going to clean the house? How come I don't get my share? Besides, see my beautiful dress? I don't want to sit on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> so, Martha, you're anxious. Now, anxiety means you don't trust God. Don't say that. Were you ever anxious, Brother Phil? 
We're all so you have to ever anxious. <laughs> you don't trust God. Amen. Does this sound familiar? It sounds like the prodigal son story. The two. And guess what we always do? Here's what our problem is. We're looking at other people. And number two, we're comparing. I'm not doing this. And thirdly, we're saying, I am better. Now keep that in mind. Why don't your prayers get heard? Because you are comparing. When we flow into the next section, when we begin the Our Father, this is really, really, you'll you get the meaning in a, in a few moments. Okay? This is really, really good. Are you getting this? No. You're getting this, young lady? You're getting this, young lady? This is good stuff. One thing is needful. What, what does Jesus say? You are breaking bristles on your broom. Everybody say that ten times real quick. Breaking bristles on your broom, breaking bristles on your broom, breaking bristles on your broom. You're breaking bristles on your broom, breaking bristles. <laughs> but that's not what we need. She has what? She has what? Has chosen the good portion. Now, what's the good portion of life? Where do we get the good portion from? Psalm 89. Choose the better portion. Choose the good portion. What does it mean that I don't have? Ready? This is really good. Turn to the person next to you. This is really good. When you choose the other portion, you choose God above all other gods. So you have somebody say, you got the church again? I need this. So what's the good portion? I chose God. Now watch the circle, we're good. Is this good stuff? The word for good in Hebrew is tov. Everybody say tov. I remember in the book of Genesis, when God creates, he says, it is good. When he creates you, he said, it's very good. He said, meto, 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 okay. When you choose the good portion, you choose God. You will break your bristles of God. Are you, are you getting what's happening here? Circle the word good portion. How many here? I'm applauding all of you. You've chosen the better portion tonight. You're getting good stuff. Yes. Amen. Amen. What? What are you doing tonight, there? You're kidding. Go watch my hours. I'll see them tomorrow. All day. All day. Amen. So, Jesus brings her to what Tov is all about. Mm -hmm. It's setting aside all the deities and pushing. What was she doing? When you're anxious. Anybody ever here been anxious before? Only the other gods make you anxious. <coughs> when you're anxious, you begin to murmur. Murmur, 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 murmur. Now they taught us in English Grammar 101. Did you pass English Grammar 101? That's called onomatopoeia. What's an onomatopoeia? An onomatopoeia is when a word sounds like, like when you hear the word buzz. We spell it B-U-Z-Z-Z-Z-Z-Z. It sounds like the action buzz. So when you murmur, 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 it sounds like you're the complaint department. So what did Martha practice? Onomatopoeia. Hmm, it sounds like there she goes again. Amen? Can you imagine being married to this babe? <laughs> Amen? Now, let me show you something very interesting. Is this good stuff, Ms. Okay, now, 
this is just an extra. You need some extra. Make a right and go into the Gospel of John. This is really good. Same place, a different time. Everyone with me in John? Oops. Go to John 11. Go to verse 17. Look at the flip. Look at the big flip. Turn to the person next to you. This is really good. Did she learn her lesson? Yes. Do you see the flip? Everybody verse 17, John 11, 17? Mm-hmm. Everybody with me, John 11, 17? Mm-hmm. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb. Same place, isn't it? And this is where Donald called out. And Lillian would not go down to save one hair on his receding hairline. <laughs> Donald was in a grave with three other crazy women. <laughs> and Lillian was going, Is he okay? I said, he, he, Lillian, he's coming out of a grave. He died. I said, oh, I don't know what's happening in there. <laughs> but Lillian would not venture down those stairs at all. <laughs> and Donald saying, Don, Don, he's coming out of the grave. He's alive, he's alive, he's alive. And then Irma's in there going, selfie, selfie, selfie. Imagine inside of a grave getting a selfie of people. It's ridiculous. <laughs> Do you see what I got to put up with? And Donald just is going all the way under and he goes, hello. I go, oh my heaven. I thought it was one of those little uh, raccoons coming out of the hole or something like that. <laughs> Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. Are you getting this? Mary what? Sat in the house. Mary, hello, it's Jesus coming. What is she doing? I'm sitting down. Mary, move your Oaxaca and get to Jesus. Verse 27. Verse 27, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, now, so who, see the flip? Uh, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died, and even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. I think they learned a lesson, amen? Jesus said, your brother will rise again. Martha said, I know, dun, 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 dun. I know that he'll rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And whoever believes and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She says, yes! No broom. No broken person. Now, who has the broken person? There. She's sitting home. And what's she saying? Lazarus is dead. Bum, bum, bum. But she missed out on the fact that Jesus says, I'm the resurrection and the life. And so what happens when Martha comes back in? He's alive, he's alive, he's alive, he's alive, he's alive. What? She said, I sat down at Jesus' feet. And what's the next step about sitting down at Jesus' feet? You say these words. I believe! And what happened? Isn't that amazing? See the flip? Now, we're going to start a little primer on prayer. Do you, do you pray? Do you pray, man? Right now, we're going to start praying with some punch in us. Amen? Are you ready to pray? Now, there's a missing ingredient in all of our prayer life, which we'll probably get more into next. But let's start to chapter 11. Good stuff? Any questions? Yes. Yes, Miss Pat. <clears throat> um, with Martha and Mary. Martha and Mary. In the first case. Yes. Was um, Martha mad at Jesus? Yes. She was mad at Jesus and at Mary. Yes. Yes, and jealous of yes. Mary. Yes. She was anxious. Yeah. When you're anxious, you complain to God. Okay, okay, yeah, that's good, yeah. Okay. And then in the second case, um, with Lazarus dying. She was bemoaning the fact he's dead. And she was probably mad at Jesus because he didn't come early. That's right. Yeah. That's, see the flip? Yeah, the flip. Yeah. The flip. Interesting, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Some people learn, some people don't learn. Yeah. Amen? Mm-hmm. It was in the same spot. Amen? Mm-hmm. You're ready to move on? Just, just a little introduction for next, next time. Good stuff? Now, 
This is so important that you get this. We need to pray. But I, I told us many times, your prayer life has been Our Father, Hail Mary, Glory be, which is great. Mm. But that's all you know. Let's go deeper, okay? You ready to go deeper? Yes. Okay, you ready to get into powerful prayer. Now, I want to take you through stages of prayer, back with me to who wrote Luke? Of what does Poppy say? Okay. All right, everybody at Luke 11. Now, let me show you some interesting things. Good stuff? We're going to do the Our Father, but it's different. Look at it. Look at verse 1. We're going to go through um, the first appearance in prayer. Now, I need new prayer words here. Anybody going to pray? Alright, one person is going to pray. Yes, ma'am. Now, ready? Yes. This time, here's, here's factoid number one. This is Jesus doing this, Luke has it, on the plane. Jesus spoke this, the, the, uh, ten, uh, the Our Father in Matthew's Gospel on the mountain. So how many times did he teach the Our Father? Several times. Now when you went to Jerusalem, do you remember Jerusalem, ma'am? They had all those Our Fathers there. There might be a tradition. Did you do all those Our Fathers? Up there on the hill of... You didn't do that? You got cheated. You've got to go back. Well, here's what you do. You call that company up right now and say, I want my money back. <laughs> you didn't go on the top of Mount Olives? Did you go on the top? Did you go in the cave? Did you go in the cave where the second coming was? You didn't go? Here's what you do. You get on that phone right away and say, I want my money back. <laughs> So, inside the cave there, that's where Jesus spoke of the second coming. Now, we're going to go in there in our next trip and we're going to talk about the second coming. And we're going to go outside and we're going to show you exactly the splitting of the mountain and where Jesus will set up his throne. This is exciting for a while. This is really exciting. This is good stuff. You might even want to go again and leave Mrs. home if she's got to stay home. <laughs> Tell her make a few minutes at home and then just come back. So here's the Our Father on the plane because Jesus is teaching the nations. All right now, let's get this down, amen? Now, we're going to go through, we're going to go through the power of prayer. And when you go through the power of prayer, you've got to remember certain ingredients to get your prayer really cooking, amen? We need to see a new brand of people who have answered their prayer. Amen? Mm -hmm. Not people who say, I'll pray for you. How many say, I'll pray for you? Or I've been praying for you. By the way, you've been praying for me, things got worse, so you better mm -hmm. stop. <laughs> <laughs> now, so let's go through this and we'll just, just give you a little introduction. Then we're going to break open the Word of God that you'll be so excited. And I'm going to tell you the missing ingredients, which you've got to do to really get cooking in prayer. Amen? Even for that interesting brother of yours, madam. That's your uncle. You know, interesting people that live with you. Now, he says to us there, he was praying in a certain place. Okay, underline that. When Jesus prays in a certain place, that's the plane. Does your Bible say plane there? Mm -hmm. Does somebody's Bible say plane? All right, here's the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus did something that most Christians don't know. They, no, they do. Um, he went into a cave at the bottom of the mountain. He lost himself. He went into a cave at the bottom of the Sermon on the Mount. What did he do in there? He had his prayer time by himself with God. Now, the certain places, guess what happened? Now, you've got to get that scene. The disciples are going, Guess what happens? 
They're coming around the bed in the cave. They're watching the prey. Whoa, how many like to watch Jesus pray? Now we do have some prayers of Jesus if you're interested. Matthew eleven twenty five. John 17. We have Jesus' actual prayers. Amen? If you want to see a prayer. And maybe we should do a whole new Bible saying on Jesus praying. Would you like to do that? Take a little sideline, just, just do all the prayers that Jesus prayed. It'll blow your mind. Amen? And he's praying in a certain place, and when he ceased, one of his disciples said to him, They're watching him. They couldn't take it. Lord! Teach us. What does it say? Teach us to pray as John toward his disciples. Oh. They saw him praying. They linked him to John. Remember John the Baptist? And John's already dead at this time. But they said John made a difference because he prayed. How did John pray? Now, what's the most important thing you could do for the rest of your life? Pray. Are you praying? Stay tuned next week to find out whether you're praying. <laughs> Father, teach us how to pray. That's the most important thing I could learn tonight. To really pray and be with you at your feet. So bless this word to our hearts, and Lord, enlighten our minds with the glory and the power of your presence. Teach us how to pray, and Lord Jesus, may we seek the better things of the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name, because we know who our neighbor is. Amen and amen. amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, have a good fourth. And write down the 12th if you want to join us in Washington Township, New Jersey, on uh, the Eucharistic Congress. We're going to be talking on a pro-life message in front of all the people gathered in the Blue Army Shrine, who are all invited.